Hello traders, welcome to another global macro update. At the start of this video, we're going to be talking about Pearson correlation coefficient. So this is a mathematical formula that people use to understand the correlation between two different, uh, in my opinion, or in my uh, world, it would be assets, but two different uh, data sets, really, it could be anything. But the way that we use this equation is to look at two assets and see how either positively or negatively correlated they are. Positively, there is a one to negative one. So we can see value of plus one is total positive linear correlation, zero is no linear correlation, and negative one is total negative linear correlation. So if it's basically at like 0.95 or 95%, that would mean that would be something similar to let's say the Nasdaq and the S&P pretty positively correlated or the Dow Jones and the S&P that would also be positively correlated or you can also see BTC and Ethereum also be, be very positively correlated and we'll talk about and we'll view different correlations at the start of this video here. But we use this to understand how investors and traders are viewing certain assets. So. Bitcoin is the new kid on the block. It's not very old compared to things like gold or equities, other traditional assets and markets. So we're still trying to make sure we have a concrete understanding of where Bitcoin is going to be in the realm of the assets that we look at. You know, we have safe haven currencies or uh, things like the US dollar, Japanese yen, uh, CHF, euro somewhat, but US dollar, Jap uh, US dollar and Japanese yen are, are very... Uh, solid safe haven currencies if there's worry anxiety fear in the markets if there's huge sell-offs those are the two currencies that are going to be doing the best uh, just looking at past performance and then you have other things like gold and silver that are due to monetary uncertainty moving to the upside where you see lots of money printing and then lots of the value in the currency the native currency that people use then you would probably see gold and silver do well like we're seeing right now we see lots of money printing we see the dxy the us dollar absolutely plummet and then you see gold and silver do very well so there's a ne negative correlation there and then you can also see uh positive correlations in the world but when you see negative positive correlation you have an understanding of where that asset is in relative to the realm of like you know the pool of assets that we trade currencies we look at cryptocurrencies we look at metals we look at equities or indexes mainly don't really look at specific stocks but um you know we have a range of uh tools that we use to speculate in the market and we're just wondering where bitcoin sits in all this especially in this time because you know, we are living in a recession. Some might think that we're out of it. We're completely fine. I think there's a huge discrepancy between where the economy is and the stock market for sure. We just saw a new high on the S&P. So I don't think that it's uh, over and things are groovy and totally fine. Um, but as of right now, we'll get into the S&P and all that stuff later. But there's definitely a huge discrepancy if there's going to be a sell-off is btc going to be looking similar to gold silver a asset used for a safe haven during uncertain monetary situations or is bitcoin going to be perceived as something like the smp where it's like a speculative instrument um i'm in, i'm on the side where it's going to be viewed more as like gold silver in that pool just because it's a fixed supply you can't make more than 21 million and it's very revolutionary in terms of its technology. It's uh, decentralized, like there's no CEO of the metal gold or silver, right? It's just a metal, you find it. Um, similar to BTC, you know, there's no real CEO or anything. Yes, there's developers, but uh, there's no one single person or team that says I created BTC. And I think uh, Satoshi Nagamono kind of created that for a specific reason to be perceived more like a commodity and less like a company, if that sort of makes sense. So how's it going, Mitch? Hopefully you're having a good day so far. So let's get into some of the correlations that we can see here. First one definitely is going to be a main one. We can see the correlations at the bottom left chart here, uh, BTC versus S&P. So we can see it goes back and forth. The average looking on your 180 day time frame. So this is going to collect 
different time frames, 360. We can take a quick look at that. If we're looking at the 300, so one year correlation, we're actually moving to the upside very, very aggressively. But then when we shrink it to the smaller time frames, we're actually reversing. And obviously, the smaller time frames are going to move quicker than the longer time frames, very similar to moving averages. So on the larger time frames, BTC is still moving to the upside in terms of correlation. We're at an all-time high, sitting around 15% or 0.15 correlation. Not super strong, but the highest we've ever seen so far. When we go into a smaller time frame, the correlation jumps up quite aggressively. We're at 0.27, which is quite aggressive, 25% correlation. You know, that's getting up there. So at this current moment, Bitcoin is perceived to be a risk on asset that's used for speculation similar to the S&P, Russell 2000, NASDAQ, and those types of assets, in my, in my particular opinion, as well as alts would be in that same pool, as well as, let's say, just talking about currencies, if you're an FX, you could be looking at odd New Zealand, CAD, GBP, those are the types of currencies that are per perceived as risk on, whereas, like I said before, USD, JPY, CHF, Euro are more perceived to be as risk off, whereas Euro, CHF recently have done pretty well, which is a little bit surprising, but um, you can never be really too surprised at 2020 at this point, really, so... That's going to be uh, the 180 and the 90. We can see it dump quite aggressively. We were sitting at the highest point uh, really ever at around 0 0.34, 0 0.33. Uh, that's a very high correlation for sure, especially when you're considering BTC as this complete other asset that is has never really been around before ever. Um, and obviously uh, the S&P has been around for a very long time. And, and the fact that they're, they're pretty positively correlated indicates that Bitcoin is right now perceived to be a risk on asset similar to the S&P in terms of uh, the means of speculation, not a means to store their value and their wealth as of right now. But we will look at gold. We will look at uh, how that correlation is going as well because that's going to be pretty important to understand. I, th I hope and I think that's going to be where Bitcoin is going to be going to. Things change, obviously, when we go to the longer time frames. It just bounces back and forth we see times of extreme negative correlation at 180 days at around 0.17 not a whole lot on the 180 but in the 90 it's around point let's say 28 almost 0.3 it just touched 0.3 there or negative 0.3 so we're above that zone right now so we're just bouncing up and down but we do have to understand the points where we do have some positive correlation and negative correlation because that in my opinion is going to be uh, where investors are perceiving Bitcoin to be in terms of either a speculative risk on asset or a safe haven risk off, right? Those are the two pools that I view assets in. And right now it's coming back. But when you're looking at a larger time frame, when you're, when you're looking at where it's been, yes, I do still think that it's considered risk on, although it is coming back. Now this is going to be BNB versus the S&P. So it's not just looking at... BTC for today. Usually we just look at BTC, BTC versus S&P, BTC versus gold, but we're going to get a little bit more into the different uh, potential correlations because this platform does provide us with a lot of options here. So this is Bitcoin, or sorry, this is Binance coin, BNB versus the S&P 500. And we're going to go and start off with 360. Not a whole lot. We don't have a lot of data, but we do see it's been positively correlated, just range bound around point, let's say 155. So around 15, 14 and a half percent correlation, which isn't extreme, but it's still positively correlated. Moving to a smaller time frame on the 180 day, we do see that it is moving to the upside, making these nice higher highs and higher lows. Right now, it looks like it's sitting around 25%, which is pretty positively correlated. But like Bitcoin, BNB is getting less correlated when you get into the smaller time frames. So in my opinion, that is somewhat a good thing because if there is going to be some level of a sell-off or... Um, it could just be, mean that the S&P is going to absolutely take off because we will talk about the S&P today and what it's doing. Um, looks really bullish, just broke out of that ascending wedge that was squeezing the price, contracting the volatility, and I think we're going to get another expansion to the upside, which is a little bit surprising, but um, got to look at the price action, not really the economic data that's coming up because it hasn't really been doing too much. So that's going to be the correlations of BNB and the S&P. Next one's going to be 
BNB versus BTC. Just a good quick uh, overview just because I already know they're positively correlated. We can see very positively correlated when we're looking at the 360. It's around 79, 80% uh, even got up there almost. So very positively correlated when you're looking at a long time frame. At 180, uh, very positively correlated as well, although it is dropping slightly. And then the 90 had a pretty severe drop there, but it does look like it is coming back. Still pretty positively correlated at 72%. S&P versus XRP, another one, uh, it's pretty big fan favorite. We do see it's pretty positively correlated at 180, 360 day. Still somewhat positively correlated, basically almost at the all time highs here in terms of correlation. And then 90, same with the alt BNB that we looked at as well as BTC. We do see XRP reducing its positive correlation with traditional risk on assets like the S&P 500. And then the classic BTC versus gold, uh, we do see a, a little bit of a jump here. So this is actually really good to see on the 90 day on 360. There's not much that's happening. So it's pretty well slightly positively correlated with BTC. But when we go on to a smaller time frame, 180 days, especially the 90 day, you do see the increase in positive correlation between BTC or sorry, this is gold in the S&P. I thought this was gold and BTC here. Give me one moment. Uh, gold and BTC. That was the original plan. Gold and I wonder where BTC is. Well, let's just do Ethereum. If I can find it, there it is. Okay, so going back to the 360 day, we do see there's, I, I looked at it before, I don't know how I got to this, but um, we looked at it before, we do see there is positive correlation, an increasing positive correlation between BTC, Ethereum, and gold, which is, in my opinion, really good to see. Right now, Ethereum and gold sitting not extremely positively correlated, but it is slowly increasing on a large time frame, on a smaller time frame. We do see that it's slowly increasing as well. And then on the 90 day, it's absolutely ripping up to the upside. So hopefully that's going to increase and rise because the metals, in my opinion, are in a bull market. You see gold and silver absolutely move to the upside very aggressively. Gold and silver ratio absolutely plummeting to the downside, which is really good for our speculation that silver is going to appreciate at a greater rate than gold. And we can also see that silver is way down below, not even close to the $48, $49 high that we saw back in 2011, whereas gold's already breached, closed, and consolidated above the high that we reached in 2011. So uh, we've got a lot of climbing to do for silver compared to gold in just the relative distance that we have from the all-time high that we reached in 2011. Not true all-time high, but relative all-time high for decades prior. The last time was in the late 70s, where we had huge worry of inflation. CPI numbers were absolutely ballooning, and the reason that happened is because we had the easy money, easy credit, free money, basically, system of the late 40s after World War II in the 50s and 60s. Um, that was a boom for America, similar to what we have after the great financial crisis where interest rates dropped to basically zero and there was a huge stimulus package or three quantitative easings that took place which injected lots of liquidity and capital into the markets basically providing a lot of free money very very easy credit because the federal funds rate are so low and we're in a very similar situation right except we're just printing a lot more money now than we printed in the late 40s 50s and 60s so it takes time you know economies take time to evolve to change to shift due to different monetary policies that central banks are implementing but i think that we will get that inflation shock and cpi numbers will go up uh, i don't think that gold and silver are too high as some people call it um I think they'll go a lot higher. I think that gold is just starting and I'd like to see a pullback. I could, like a, not a crazy pullback, but a deeper pullback, maybe back to 2K, maybe create a nice wedge triangle and then really start to squeeze and consolidate and contract in volatility for the next move to the upside. Maybe potentially a descending wedge or a symmetrical triangle would be really, really great to see. And then silver hopefully will be 
uh, creating a structure similar to that that would be in confluence with the breakout of gold. That's the overall structure that I'm looking at for the global macro. I don't think it's going to be stopping. And that's why I want to see Bitcoin more positively correlated with gold and silver or like Ethereum or cryptos positively correlated with metals, basically because I want them to be in the same pool of if currencies start to weaken due to the proliferation and basically money printing that most central banks have been uh, basically doing for, you know, not just because of COVID, but uh, for a while now that they, they have no other tool or option. Their interest rates are already at zero. How do they stimulate, right? They don't want a recession. There's a lot of pensions that depend on the stock market in the US alone. And uh, if they have the ability to steal the wealth from everyone and keep it afloat, um, obviously history shows that they like to do that instead of uh, choosing other alternatives. So that's the correlation of BTC, the S&P, gold, and just a mixture of those together to have a good understanding of where Bitcoin sits in the financial markets that we looked at today. Because this is a very important topic and to understand how you trade cryptocurrency markets, we have to understand first where they lie in the global macro sense. Because it's not like cryptocurrencies are this own little bubble that... Um, are, is not affected by the rest of the world. Of course, they're affected by the rest of the world, especially if Bitcoin grows and increases in price and gains more you know, adoption and people use it more for a hedge of inflation or monetary uncertainty similar to gold. Well, then there's going to even be more influence of you know, other world factors on Bitcoin. It's not going to be its own little world, its own little crypto sphere where it's insulated by, you know, small traders and not really institutions that trade it. Now institutions are getting into it. So it's treated more of a global macro asset, which is a positive thing in my view. So that's going to be a little bit of information on correlations. We're now going to get into the S&P here. So let's jump right into it, starting from the daily. So we did talk about the squeeze within the ascending wedge. We were just anticipating for two options. The first option was a melt to the upside. We wanted to see that pullback, which did occur. And in my opinion, we're now in a situation where we are in a very risk on sentiment environment, where I do think that there's op opportunities to long Bitcoin, Ethereum, and if you're trading in FX, um, you could look at Australian dollars been doing pretty well. New Zealand dollars positively correlated with odd. So that's an option. And GBP had been doing pretty well um, in recent times. So that could be an option. And then things like the US dollar, Japanese yen are not doing well. So that's a very risk on type of environment, similar to what we saw in April, May, uh, where we saw huge recoveries in a lot of the assets that are considered to be risk on. So in terms of price action, it's very bullish. It's very positive. It's very optimistic. It's very hopeful. So when we go into a smaller time frame here, uh, understanding that, let's just make sure that we know where that high is. And then just a key zone. Let's go to the weekly. And that's that key zone right around there. So we see candle closures and then we see wicks right there. That to me is a very significant zone. So right around there. It's not going to be an absolute uh, exact price point. It's going to be an area is how I view certain levels. So that's going to be the zone right there. We just passed this level, key level of support and resistance. So definitely zone of confluence right there, which we passed. And then we're passing that level too. All right, so now that we understand that, we can then look at this ascending wedge. So we see our first level support turn resistance, and then we see our se second key of rejection, and then we see our third key of rejection. So then we know that there's sell pressure right around here. And then there's lots of buy pressure with support, support, uh, not a perfect support, very re well respected, very well respected all along here on the daily very well respected all throughout this zone. And then we saw a very tight contraction in price action right there. And then we got the price to squeeze out, consolidate above, retest that previous resistance as a new level of support. And then now we're moving to the upside. So that's where it is on a large time frame. 
let's z now zoom into the breakout, the retest, and then the continuation of the impulsive push that we're seeing right now. So what I'm going to do is just redraw this because it's not extended enough. So let's just go to the six hour maybe and delete this. Like so. And try to make it as large as I can. There we go. And then I'm pretty happy with not really extending that, but I will extend just the line there. Cool. All right, and then that $3,200 area is a key level, which, which now is going to be this zone right here because we now have this area of confluence, which is now going to be acting as a key level of support along with this horizontal level right there. So then if we pass below that zone, we could just be see a fake blow off top, which theoretically that should move to the upside because it broke key levels of resistance and validated him for new levels of support. But it could fake out, move to the downside and then trade right around here. And then if it breaks this key confluence zone where you see both ascending zones come together at a point, that's going to be a key level of demand. If it breaks below that zone, that's definitely going to be a little bit of a worry. Then you could see some topping like that, where then you're trading like this and then you're trading like this, making lower highs, either holding a horizontal zone or a descending zone, uh, creating a top. And then you will see some level of horizontal zone like you've seen on some tops and bottoms. And then you're looking for a break below that $3,200 zone for continuation. So sell off, recovery, noise, and then you're looking for a continuation pattern before it makes a move to the downside for your top continuation will move to the downside. That would be the ideal situation for a short. I wouldn't look for anything to the downside until it gets to below the $3,200 zone, just because you're really fighting the trend here. It just really does not make sense. Yes, that is a pretty decent move, but um, I personally would just rather not fight the trend and wait to see a confirmation of a potential move to the downside before we see a possible actual uh, dependable trade that we see for a short. And then for longs, uh, I will be using this zone as a level of support. So I will be looking for continuation patterns. If we get something like this on a smaller time frame, we do see this previous resistance that if that holds for a new level of support, and then we see something like this, that would be a good option for me as well. So we're going to be mainly looking for wedges and triangles and bases. We break, retest, and then move to the upside. So those are going to be the options that I have on the SMP. But overall, it does look a lot more bullish. And the SMP is going to be a huge asset for me to just analyze overall global sentiment. So global risk sentiment. So I want to make sure that we have a good understanding. This is going to give me a huge understanding of our people looking for speculative trades that they are hopeful that's going to move to the upside. They don't mind taking a little bit more risk because they anticipate it going up or they're fearful, worried, anxious, and they are just wanting to be safe. They don't want to take any risk. Right now, people are taking risk, right? We see Bitcoin move to, Bitcoin move to the upside. We see FX do something similar. We see the US indexes do something similar as well. So overall, we do see speculative investments and trades being taken in the financial markets. I'm just gonna draw something very quickly here on BTC. Also for anyone who does have any questions, don't hesitate to drop them in the comment section below and uh, I'll be sure to uh, uh, answer any of those questions there. All right, so I'm just uh, doing one thing. All right, 
And then I'm just setting some orders here. Give me one moment. For those who are watching live, I don't worry about uh, asking any questions. I will be answering, but obviously I do say that every single video. So I assume people already know that. All right. So the next thing we're going to be looking at is the NASDAQ. But I think I will quickly touch on the VIX before talking about the NASDAQ because the VIX is pretty important and this is the uh, VIX for the S&P, so volatility index for the S&P. So what we're seeing right now is a squeeze on this $22 area, which has been a key level of resistance, which is now acting as a key level of support for our first move up. That was the early June dump that we had that was a little bit worrying, but we were able to hold and recover from that. And then now we're squeezing at that same zone, very well respected level of support. So what I'm looking for, if we are gonna get a move to the upside, is not only do we need to see the descending zone break, but we also need to see this market structure break right here, in my personal opinion, because we could consolidate like there, but we don't see market structure break. We need to see both things break in order for us to look for an opportunity uh, for the VIX possibly moving to the upside, which means that the S&P is going to fall. But uh, in a risk on world, ideally, we're going to see just a very weak, uh, just fade, kind of like we saw right here, where we saw like that. And then you, or I guess not really perfect, but you saw a little bit of fade right there, although you did get a sell off. Let's look for another one, kind of like this, where you see a pump. And then you just see a nice fade and then weakness for like a handful of days, right? That would be a pretty decent opportunity for risk on exposure, in my opinion. And then now to the NASDAQ, let's go on the tech index here and let's go to a large time frame. We do see it very, very bullish overall that 10.5K ish zone is a very significant level of support that I am looking at both horizontally and this ascending level of resistance, which is now acting as a new level of support. So overall, it does look pretty bullish for the NASDAQ. Let's look at the daily. So we did see some consolidation here on top of that zone, holding that previous resistance as a new level of support, which is good to see. And then when we go on to a smaller time frame, we see this resistance here, one, two, and then we did see some hesitation. When we actually zoom in here, we do see that as a resistance turning into a support right there. So we do see lots of wicks above that area, no candle closings, no candle closures below or above that zone. And then when we go and take a look at the right side, we do see wicks to the downside, no candles closing below that area. So that zone is a major level of significance. We tested, could not break it. Second attempt, broke it, retested, and we're moving to the upside. So definitely we are in a bullish breakout for the NASDAQ, and my expectation is it's gonna continue here, just because the S&P looks pretty strong. And that was a very, very strong impulsive push that we had. Nice squeeze right there. So good solid breakout. Previous resistance turned into strong new level of support, squeezing the price from a descending zone to a new level of support, which is a very solid pattern. And then you do see a retest with this candle right there when we go into a smaller time frame. How perfect is that? Wow. And we can even go like this and get our previous high right there, right? Previous high, previous high, new level of support. And then a massive shoot up, overshoot on the move, let's just look at where the target would have been, somewhere around there, so definitely overshot. And then let's just play around with it to see if we can identify any potential higher levels of support that it could be retesting. I see one, it's a ascending zone, right around there. And if we really want to go back, let's just see. Don't really love using anything further than that. I'm going to go stick 
just with that guy right there. And then I'm gonna go and uh, put a projection on there. Like so. And then I'm gonna, actually I'll leave that, I'll take away this, I'll take away this. And that's gonna be the ascending zone for the level of support. And I gotta tuck that in a little bit tighter. There we go. So that's gonna be the ascending zone. That would be the melt up for the NASDAQ. So then we would be looking at a zone like this, just for the midpoint. And then drop to a smaller time frame, drop to a smaller time frame. Don't really see a whole lot of hesitation anywhere where we want to have a potential level of support. The candle closures is where I usually go. Don't really see anything of uh, a nice zone. I guess when you're looking at a five minute, that would be a potential level of support right around there, which would be in confluence with the ascending zone. And then ideally something like this would be really nice to see. And then you would see, let's get our brush. With a previous resistance, new level of support. That is the type of structure that would be a beautiful structure in my view. So that's gonna be the NASDAQ. Let's go to the large time frame and just see what it does from here. Maybe stick on the 30 minute here to see if it'll come back, but Overall, I'm bullish on the NASDAQ, so I'm going to be looking at the market in that particular viewpoint. And then we'll end off with the Russell 2000, which has finally hit the early June highs right there. And it just looks like we're consolidating. Let's just go to a smaller time frame. Yeah, if we're really being strict, we could say right there we're holding as a new level of support, although I'm sure we did put it up there for a reason. Yeah, not, not bad. I actually think that that's a better spot for it, which would mean that it's gonna be holding as a new level of support. Let's go on the two hour. Ooh, I kinda like this, making lower highs. I always like when a price recently broke out into a new high, passing a key level of resistance, and then it comes back and consolidates, forming lower highs, holding that level of support, which has been a previous level of resistance. That's a structure I really enjoy seeing and trading so uh this looks pretty decent here for rut or rtoi if you're trading on futures or if you're trading on the actual equity itself or the index itself it's not really an equity so right now uh we can probably also put an ascending zone right there i'm going to leave it just as a support just because i like to understand that this is a major zone and i'll keep it there and then what we're looking for is a squeeze within that zone and then a break retest and then a continuation of push with some level of resistance turning to support as well so that would be the ideal situation for the russell 2000 i'm pretty bullish on the overall markets for risk on assets so i think you might be able to understand that just by the direction that i'm viewing the market and the way that i think it's going to go but that sort of makes sense from where it currently is in my point of view. So that's gonna be the global macro update. Hopefully you enjoyed it. Don't really see any, any questions coming in. So I assume I either answered them or explained it in a way that doesn't really require questions or you're just spectators and don't really care more other than what I have to say. So hopefully you're having a good trading week and uh, hopefully you got some information, education or just you know, a second opinion from a stranger online. So that's the goal of this is hopefully you get something out of it and uh, I enjoy making them as well. So thank you very much for coming to the video. If you enjoyed it, give it a thumbs up. If you think that uh, we should create more videos like this, subscribe for more videos because we do provide them very regularly. So until next time, have a good one, everyone.